Okay, so John, in your peak, you scaled your agency to how much? 120K a month. Who do you watch these days? Who do you study? I typically try to listen to a book every night before I fall asleep. Even listen to like dating book, like pickup book. If you're a good agency owner in your 20s, you'll be an insane SaaS owner in your 30s. So what's a problem you feel like could be solved with a SaaS? Mm -hmm. I tried to rebuild GHL. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see in the world right now that you would want your younger self to have been aware of? At the end of the day, it is supposed to be hard because if it wasn't, then nobody would appreciate it. Well, why do you think you were able to do more than others? Agency was the best option, so that's why I took it so seriously. What does your faith mean to you? I just feel like if you're a Christian, you're under attack. I don't actually believe that anybody has a problem with Jesus. I feel like people have a problem with Christians. Agency owners, here's a truth bump for you. You don't need more appointments. Your clients do. The truth is, if you don't actually get your customers' results, it doesn't matter how many sales calls you get. You're going to be pouring water into a leaky bucket and you're going to be trying to outrun a terrible product. You know what the best entrepreneurs do? They figure out how to build the best product first and then they go market and then they go sell. So if you want to learn how agency owners like Mizloff are getting their clients five deals in their first three weeks or how people like Richard are closing $50,000 in contracts for their local business in the first five days of using this new AI software or if you want to know how people like Edvin scaled their agency to 30k a month contract value at 15 years old, tap the link on this ad and I'll show you the new AI system that is changing the game for agency owners. I'm not selling you a course. I'm not selling you a mastermind. You'll get that for free if you sign up for the software. All you have to do is tap the link on this ad. It's time we change this industry. Okay, so John, in your peak, yep. you scaled your agency to how much? 220K a month. 220K a month. And you were just telling me it wasn't one of those PIF agencies. No, we did very few PIFs. Very few PIFs. But like also, to our credit, that's why I think we were so consistent for so long. Because mm. did very few PIFs. Mm. Now, we did some. But like I didn't even do a big discount for it. Really? So like it was just like, yeah, you want a piff? 10% off or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was never like, because you know how some people do it is like, oh, it's 10K and if you piff, it's five or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, obviously you're going to get more piffs. But I don't know, dude, I didn't, um, I didn't love the piffs because I just like the recurring revenue. Yeah. But, you know, my first um, mentor, Judge, Judge Graham, he literally wrote a book called Mastering Recurring Revenue. It was like the first, really? yeah, it was like the first business book that I ever read. So huh. I just got obsessed with recurring revenue. So what'd you learn from that book? Because this is a big problem in this mm -hmm. space right now is everybody's yeah. flexing vanity numbers yeah. that come from cash collected, but they don't sustain it. Yeah. So what'd you learn from that book? Yeah. So I forget who I was telling this to the other day. I was like, I was telling somebody about the agency or podcast or something. And I was like, I'm not necessarily like, the feed is not the revenue. The feed is like we did it very consistently for like a sustained period of time, really from 2020 to 2023. And so, um, okay, when the way Judge explained it to me was like the reason you need recurring revenue is COVID. Because like COVID like knocks so many people's customers out that it's like if you didn't have recurring revenue, like a lot of people were going basically from scratch. You know what I mean? Because it's like mm -hmm. sales were slower. The economy was kind of weird at that time, et cetera. So it's like if you have people on recurring revenue, then they're going to, you know continue to pay and continue to stay. And I don't know, it was just much easier for me to forecast. So I actually, in 2020, I bought Uplevel and I, uh, Sam's program. Okay, and then Sam I, Ovens? Yep, Sam Ovens, wow. his main like Uplevel program in 2020. And I said, I'm not gonna do agency, I'm gonna do realtor coaching. Mm. And we did like 50K in the first month, it was awesome. Wow. You know, margins were really good. And me and Adam didn't really have to work all that much. And then the next month, <laughs> We did like 15 yeah. and I was like, I don't like this, dude. Yeah. This is horrible. So I was like, okay, well, we need to go back to the agency so we can get the recurring revenue. Because it was PIFs. That were it, well, yeah, PIFs. with coaching, it's typically PIFs. It's not yeah. recurring. You know, it's like a program and you just buy it one off. And so we had a few people on payment plans, but it was like, okay, I want to sell something once and get paid from it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because then it, it stresses like the, the, then the sales become nice to have, not need to have. Right, if when you're doing the recurring but revenue model, then the model. product becomes the need to have, and exactly. it seems like product building a good product is actually much harder than building yep. a good sales team. I completely agree. Like. I completely agree. But another thing to remember is the better the product gets, the easier it becomes to sell. Exactly. Right. It's like how hard is it for Apple to sell an iPhone? Right. You know, but because it, it's like you have like a rocket ship right. in your pocket. You know what I mean? It's easy to sell. It's a great product. Do you feel like you built that for Lead Jolt, your agency? I think that we were we were. We did the best we could. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'd say. Um, I'm with you. You know, I think we did the absolute best we could. And I think that, um, 
you know, I, I think that it, it evolved with time for sure. Um, so I think we did the best we could. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I would say, well, obviously, we, so your niche was real estate agents. Mm -hmm. You were in an ad agency for mm -hmm. realtors. Anybody who's ever seen my stuff knows that's exactly what I did with the state. Mm -hmm. And I would give the same answer. We did the best we could. Yep. But realtors are just a very difficult person to work yep. with. And yep. I'm guessing you ran into that. A lot of yeah. complaints, a lot of fires. Yeah, a lot of fires. Just yeah. a lot of, you're just dealing with people that are, um, bro, they spent $2,000 to get their career. Right, so it's like if you work with doctor or lawyer, they spent two hundred thousand. Our guy, our guys spent two thousand. Yeah, and some of them failed the test the first time they took it. You know, I remember like I would talk to somebody on a sales call, and they'd be like, "Yeah, I took the I took the test seven times," and I'd be like, "You should quit, dude. You know, if it took you seven times, you shouldn't be selling somebody's home. You know what I mean? I know that's brutal. That's that's a that's that's really mean to say, but um, in all seriousness, like you're you just it's unsophisticated people, bro. You're dealing with an unsophisticated market. I always compare it to the SMMA world. Yeah, one hundred percent. You dude. buy a course and that's it. You don't even have to take a test in SMMA. You just yeah, buy a course. You just buy a course. Thing, you know, you're a marketer. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So you know, realtors they're definitely fun, and we had some great ones too. But uh, it's just like every industry, you're gonna have some people that stink, and you're gonna have some people that are great. You know, yeah. just like this world that we're in. So, or software, or any other business, insurance. You know, so um, yeah, it was fun. Realtors were fun. They're they're a you know tough tough yeah. puzzle to solve. That's exactly it. But it's a good challenge because after you work with hundreds of realtors, yeah. you feel like you can work with anybody. I agree. Because it's like it can't get worse. I agree. But I also don't think that it's like, I think some people look at like my agency or yours and they kind of feel like it's like the easy mode niche. But I actually feel like it's one of the hardest ones. How so? Because there's so much to stand out from, right? So it's like, yeah, that it is saturated, you know, and people say like, oh, well, they worry about the saturation or whatever. It can be good and bad, but like I think that you've got to break through the noise. That's the hard part. And once you do, like it's easy, but you have to spend a lot of time like breaking through the noise and positioning something that feels different, you know what I mean? Rather than saying, you know, hey, we run your Facebook ads, you know, yeah. as an example. So I just think there's just a lot of noise and then you have to just stand out among the noise. Yeah, it is a difficult challenge on the acquisition side because yeah. there are so, there's so much competition for it. So you scaled that up to 220K a month MRR basically, yep. which is incredible. Yep. I think our MRR, the highest, was probably 130, 140. Like we had a lot of piffs. But yeah, we didn't do the piffs, bro. 220. We just do you never... wish you did going back? Like, do you wish you saw um, the 6K piff? That's a great question. This is a hot debate in this world right now. Yeah. Like Josh Rivera, he did the piff model, got up to 275K a month in eight months, scaled super fast. But now he's like, I hate piffs. Like, I want to do MRR. Only. Yeah. So what do you um, think? No, I like MRR. MRR. No yeah. pips. I mean, they're good occasionally. And what I will say, bro, is if we had months where we brought on a new team or if we had a bunch of expenses or I was like, yo, we need to liquidate some ad spend, then we might have done the pips. Mm. And then I also I also did specials and stuff as well. So I would do like, hey, What's Christmas is coming up. You know, our service is 15% mm. off or you get a month free or uh, you credit to your ad spend or whatever. So we did a lot of Smart. stuff like that as well. You know, I really looked at it almost like a SaaS company. Like I operated like a SaaS company with like MRR, quarterly discounts, specials. Like I did a lot of that kind of stuff and I think that helped a lot. Yeah. But even our branding was felt like a SaaS company. Did you study SaaS companies to be able to do that? Yeah, because there wasn't really anybody in the agency world to study, bro. You know what I mean? Like at that point. So it was like, okay. I mean, our biggest competitor at the time was a SaaS pretty much. Bold Who? Leads. Bold Leads. You know, they're pretty much a SaaS platform. Yeah. They do some ads and I think they have a few media buyers and stuff, but it's mainly like a software platform. Mm. And that is kind of like a lot of the, you know, platforms out there. They are more software based. So I kind of studied a lot of software stuff because I feel like they have it figured out with the churn and the, you I think know, that's such retention. A good, and it's such a good point. And it's so overlooked in the space. Everybody's looking at like SMMA gurus. Really, they should just be studying the software guys, the tech CEOs. Yeah, like, dude. They, those are the people who know business better than anyone else. I think it was, I think Nathan Lacka or maybe Nathan Barry, one of those two. It's one of the Nathans. They were like, if you're an agency owner, a good agency owner in your 20s, you'll be an insane SaaS owner in your 30s. Wow. So I was like, okay, that's, I never really thought about it like that. But Alex Becker, as an example, Sam Ovens kind of had a SaaS or uh, had an uh, agency as well, yeah, coaching agency, sure. cult, consulting agency. Um, and there's probably more that I'm just not thinking. I think Nathan Berry, who did convert kit had an agency before that as mm. well. So, uh, close as an example, close.com, 
they actually built the tool for themselves. I think they had a sales agency. Um, Steli mm. FD is the founder of, of, of Close. So you have to fact check me on that someone, but it's like I think they started out with like they're going to build the tool for themselves and they're like, this tool's badass, let's just sell this. That's always what I've been taught in the, the world of SaaS is the best problem you can solve is your own problem. Mm. If you can solve your own problem, that's like, that's what a point was, was to me is I actually started as a customer of it. Really? So like I, they, they sold it to me. So a friend recommended it to me. I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, let me buy it. And so I just started as a customer. And I was like, well, I really want to come up with my own idea, but this is clearly a real problem because I'm actually paying somebody for it. So maybe I should just do it. Yeah. So what would you do? What would you build if you had to build a software? Like what's a, what's a problem you ran into in the agency world? that you feel like could be solved with a SaaS? Mm. Is there anything that comes to mind? Not really, because no, if there I'm, was, I would have done it. That's what I was going to say. I tried to think of so many things. You know, because I love SaaS. You know, really? we did a SaaS, we did SaaS for Legal. We started building it. I made a lot of mistakes, spent a bunch of money. What did you try to it. build? I tried to... <laughs> dude, I tried to rebuild GHL. <laughs> and I, dude, we spent we spent like a hundred grand on it. Oh, frick, dude. And I spent like about a about no. hundred grand and I got like, 50% of the way done. Oh, shoot. And so it's it always some, happens. At some point, I tell myself that I'll finish it and then just flip it. Because I like it was badass. It was nice. Really? Yeah, it was very, it was very cool. Um, but I just... That was just an example of just Dang. being stupid. Like, that's just pure stupidity on my end. Because I actually had a bunch of people tell me, don't do it. Right. You know? So, like, a lot of the people that were, like, much further along than me were like, dude, don't do this. Yeah. And, that's funny. And I was just like, well, Screw like, you. what do you know? <laughs> Mr. Guy that made $100 million. You know, it's like, you know, and in Hermosi said in a million videos, don't do a SaaS unless your partner is technical, as an example. Like, he would say that many, many times over. Don't pay a development agency. And uh, I was like, what do you know, Hermosi? You know what I mean? And it's like, I'm an idiot for that. You know what I mean? But again, it's, um, you know, you can, what, what does it say in the Bible? Don't cast your pearls to swine. They might turn around and bite you for it. Jesus says that in Matthew. So it's like in that example, I was the swine because somebody was passing me some pearls and saying, don't do this. Yeah. And rather than taking their advice, I was almost uh, slapping them in the face for the advice. Yeah. You know what I mean, so it's like, that's kind of the way that I think about it as well. It's like, you kind of have, like normally when you make bad decisions, they come out of some sort of arrogance, you know, of like, oh, I know better than everyone else. So that's just like a good example. Like I just, that's just like stupid tax that I paid. Wow. You know, that's so powerful. I was thinking about this last night and today. You know, the, the word says pride comes before the fall. Yep. And yeah. self-importance comes before destruction. Yep. And I was trying to think of, like, what's the key to making good decisions? And it's actually humility. Yep. 100%, dude. It's, it's just, and I, I read this yesterday. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Yep. And the more you do, it's like, that's what made Jesus such an incredible role model and figure was just, he said the son of man came not to serve came not to be served but to serve yep. like his entire motto that he embodied was just servitude and that's what makes great leaders that's what mm -hmm. makes great entrepreneurs they have a heart of service yep so it's really cool to hear you say that i will say i'm not gonna lie i wanted to build ghl too At a couple there were a couple points where i was like man i could rebuild this well you know make it a little bit better it's, i it's became really a little dumb. i became a little schizo okay. because <laughs> what i did was i just became I don't know, bro. I was just like, I was freaking out because at the time I had a friend who had an agency in mortgage that was doing 400K a month. Okay. I was doing 200K plus a month. Uh, I had a guy that I knew that in automotive that was doing like 150 a month. So I had a, my circle was like all just badass agency owners. And um, I got super paranoid because I was like, I think GHL might do like, you know how what Amazon will do. So Amazon, if, if me and you start a battery brand, and it we, crushes. you know, it crushes. We just call it like Matt and John batteries. Amazon's going to be like, hmm, I'm going to make this for myself mm. and no more Matt and John batteries in our businesses. Right. Wow. And so I kind of was like, I'm afraid GHL is going to do that. So I got like this paranoid schizophrenia that I was like, oh my gosh, GHL is going to steal all my really? businesses. Yeah. Because I mean, really like the way I was thinking about it, I was like, I don't really know what the data agreement is. GHL has all these leads. They have all this data. I wasn't necessarily afraid of like GHL doing it. I was afraid they would exit and then the company that bought them would basically say like, hey, go directly to the source. You know, like we've, we have all this data, we have all these customers, we have all this stuff. Because I don't really even know what the data agreement is with GHL. Like I don't mm. know if GHL has full access to your data and they can even use it if they want to. So I don't even know that. But I got like this 
paranoid like schizo brain of yeah. like and also I wanted to have a big, big exit. So I was like, okay, if I'm gonna have a big, big exit, then I can't be this is another lesson I learned from Judge. You can't be too reliant on a software. So for instance, if me and you do like a LinkedIn automation tool, that might be hard to eventually like have a huge exit from because what if LinkedIn yeah. changes the whole thing? That's what I'm terrified about with employee wise. That. Yeah, that <laughs> is like if GHL if something happens to GHL we're screwed, or if they rebuild this better, which I they already have AI and it's pretty bad, but it's it's risky. It's risky. Yeah, but uh, you know, eventually you'll be able to monkey branch on it just doing your own platform. Perhaps. You know. Perhaps. Eventually, it's, it's hard to build a CRM platform though, as you know, as you know. Bro, I'll sell you one. It, <laughs> I'll pay you five grand. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mention people doubting you on SaaS though. It's because to some extent, that's what makes us great entrepreneurs. Is people doubt us? They doubt yeah. our journey, and we do it anyway. Yeah. But eventually people that we should probably actually listen yeah. to doubt us. There you go. But I also feel like there's a time where if you're so convicted and everyone's telling you it's a bad idea, don't do it. Like, It's a coin you flip. Have, you, you do have to have some ability to see the vision that other people just can't see. Yep. And you have to have some faith in yourself, yep. in God, in whatever. You have to have yeah. something that's like, because everybody told me don't do it point wise. Yeah. Iman told me don't do it point. Really? Just, like, it was just like sass, bro. I was like, don't do it. Eddie Malouf was like, don't do it. Like Eddie was like, really don't do it. Brian Burt, if you know Brian Burt, mm -mm. uh, nine-figure agency owner guy, I talked to him about it one day, and he's like, dude, sad. like every, the most successful, the three most successful people I knew probably, I was fortunate enough to talk to them about SaaS. Yeah. They had all been killers in business, eight-figure, nine-figure business owners, and they all were like, don't, don't do, do SaaS. Yeah, And I was just like, I'm, I just can't listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, for, I just couldn't. For me, it wasn't that, here's the way I think about this, right? Okay. It wasn't that, the SaaS was a bad move, it's that it was the wrong timing. Mm. So if I'm getting, let's just say 4X on cash on ad spend, which is kind of where we floated around. It's good. You know, and then we had contracts as well. Especially with MRR. So I could have just, that That means that I actually spent 400,000 on the software. Ooh. That's the way I think about it. So that's why it was stupid because it wasn't the best place to put the capital at the time yeah. when I could have put it elsewhere and got more outsized return for it. So that's why I think it was stupid. Where do you want to put your capital now? It's a great question. Um, I, bro, I just love businesses. So like, uh, like these people that are obsessed with like stocks or real estate or all these things, like that's awesome. I know some people that's their thing. But for me, I just think that businesses, like what does the S&P consist of? Businesses. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so really when you buy the S&P, you're just buying a bunch of businesses yeah. and you're just getting a, a vested piece of the businesses. But like, why not build your own businesses and then have your own S&P, mm -hmm. you know? So- Do you want to invest then in like buy, like private equity what, stuff? 100%, that's the, I think that is the like the trend, like the ascension up the skill ladder, right? Because it's like Hermosi's got a good, it's always cool, dude, when there's somebody that's laid out the path before you, right? It's like the whole, you stand on the shoulders of giants type of thing. And I think that's what made it like hard for my agency because I just didn't know if like million a month people at that point. Like I didn't, I didn't know if there was that many out there. Uh, and now there's a bunch. So it's like, or there's not a bunch, but a few. And so it's like, you kind of can see what they've done and model them, et cetera. And then there's other people that kind of walk the path. But like now Hermosi is like blazing the path for like the private equity stuff and kind of coming from the marketing world and yeah. the internet world and stuff like that. So yeah, bro, for sure. I think that's the thing that's most interesting to me is just having a bunch of businesses that I have ownership in because it's like, yeah. that's how I leverage my skill set. You yeah. know what I mean? Because it's like, I can't, uh, it's not a good skill set leverage for me to go do like real estate investing or stocks because it's like, yeah. I have to learn a whole new skill set, right? you know, that I've developed for the last six years. So it's like, you know, people, like Hermosi talks about this all the time, but it's like people get become successful with one skill set and then they're like, okay, well now that I've done this, I need to go do something entirely different. And that's weird. That's mm. dumb almost, you know? So it's like, for, for instance, I bought in 2022, uh, like a section eight real estate investing program. Okay. It was like five grand. Yeah. And dude, I think I made, I went through like two modules. Yeah. Cause I was like, why am I doing this? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I am getting insane results with my business. Like just double down. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, it, it, when I when I think about it through sports, it makes a lot more sense. Like if I'm amazing at baseball, then I should just go play more baseball and become even more amazing. Whereas like, dude, Michael Jordan did the exact same thing. 
Like, he went to play baseball, and he was good. He could play. He was still a professional baseball player. Right. But he's, like, the greatest basketball, basketball player, player ever, yeah. right? So it's like, he, I, I guarantee he regrets taking a year or two years to go play baseball, unless he just wanted to do it for fun, which, you know, he was going through a lot, I guess, when he did that. But it's like, he did that, and it's like, he was good. So, like, you and I would probably be good at, you know, some random thing, stocks or, you know, Amazon stores or whatever. Right. But it's like, that doesn't necessarily mean we should. You know, just because right. you can doesn't mean you should. So, to me, Great point. businesses are the most interesting thing. Yeah, it is where you get the best point. ROI, too. Now, to go even deeper into that, your experiences in digital businesses. Mm-hmm. So, are you trying to buy businesses that are, like, local? Like, Jared, uh, I don't know how deep you guys went, but you guys... I can see you guys hitting it off. I don't know how well you. Yeah, know we got. We, yeah, we got. We got along well. We yeah. know each other for a while though. Because he's doing a similar thing. He's he's now trying to buy businesses, mm-hmm. but he wants to go local. Yeah, I think so, that's cool. Yeah, it, but my concern there is also well, local is completely different than digital in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, one hundred percent. So right, right now, I'm just we're doing the stuff with AC, and I'm just working with agency owners, and that's been a blast. So that's yeah. really the main thing. I I only try to do like one thing at a time, pretty much. I've never been great at doing a bunch of. You know, having a bunch of hands in the fire at once. Yeah, um, which is good. You know, so I just I just can't do it, bro. Because like one thing will fall by the wayside. So right now it's just AC, but I definitely can, I think that is a good play to do like take the digital skill set to the like old archaic, you know, local business. Yeah, which is cool, but it is a different game. But at the same time, is it? Like that's my devil's advocate because it's like sales and marketing these are all really when you dumb it down to the simplest form it's just human psychology and knowing how to leverage psychology it's true so it's like it's true it really the whole game of business really just comes down to human psychology yeah. leadership marketing sales it's all yep customer experience it's all it's all psychology but in different vehicles you require like a different skill set way of integrating yeah. that psychology like software like jared would be a bad SaaS entrepreneur he just would. Like, I know it. And I would be a terrible local business owner. Yeah. I just, it, it's not... Your skill set. It's not me. Yeah, I um, get that. I get that. And I also think it also depends on what you're most interested in. Yes. You know? Because it's like, to me, if you have a... I would almost rather have... If I, if I had to pick an agency owner, as an example, to invest in, I would honestly rather go with the one who's like obsessed with agency and like super interested in it, yeah. other than the one who already has some skills maybe, but yeah. you know, one foot in, one foot out. Because, like, I also think that the reason that I've, like, progressed is because I genuinely love doing this. Mm. Like, I never had to convince myself to, like, read a marketing book or, like, read a sales book or, you know, you know those days yeah. where you don't feel like it may be. But I've never been, like, in this, like, forcing myself to do this stuff because I enjoy doing it. Yeah. I love, you know, being able to come up with ideas and make money from the ideas. I think it's the coolest thing ever. So it's, like... I also think it depends on that. It's like, because if Jared has no interest in SaaS and you have no interest in local business, then it's like... Of course, we're not going to be good at exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, and that's a, th- that's a lot of people in this world are just seeing somebody else's success and they're having a mimetic desire yep. of something they don't have a mimetic passion for. Yep. And I think that's... They have the desire without the passion and that leads yep. to the suffering of, well, yeah, you're trying to build an e-com store and like you want to be talking to people all day yep. or vice versa. Yep. You're trying to build an agency and you just want to be in the background Back in. building a website yep. for somebody. So, yeah, 100%, dude. That's, that's why you got to find like what you like the best, you know, yeah. and what you're most interested in. I have the courage so. to follow it, mm. which I think is one of the biggest things actually lacking in people is just confidence. Yep. It's oh, like dude. A, just Undoubtedly tr- so. Trying to attach on to somebody else's confidence and make it their own rather than tapping into their own. Dude, It's like Gary Vee kind of... The more I the more I mature, I feel like I learned Gary Vee actually is a... Like, he actually hits the nail on the head. Oh, Gary Vee's a wizard, stuff. bro. He's actually a wizard. Yeah. He's actually a wizard, and he's a G. He's I a love G. Gary he's a G, and and he's er- been early on so much stuff. He Think about how early he was on like content. Like you need to do content, dude. He's right, bro. He's, he's right. like Nostradamus. Like he can predict the future. You know what I mean? Like Low he's key. yeah, he's he's, 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 a, he's insane. It's incredible. And First business book I read was, was Crush It. Crush It. Yeah. Huh. I never. I've never read any of his books, but he says self awareness is like the most under. It's the most underlooked skill or overlooked skill in the world is self awareness. Yep being able to actually understand yourself to then know how to utilize what you have. Sounds so simple. It sounds just so like guru, but he's actually right. Yep. Um, who do you watch these days? Who do you study? What's, how do you take in information? Because you've already built seven-figure businesses. Yeah. You know a lot of – you've interviewed Grant Cardone yeah. and 
uh, you coached for some big names in the space. Like you've known a lot mm-hmm. of these killers. Who are you actually studying? Hmm. That's, bro. I feel like I am. Um... Okay, so you know, if you're into anime, you'll watch like Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. And then you'll watch, you know, whatever like Naruto or you know, you'll watch the popular animes. <laughs> And then you'll get more and more into it and you'll go deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. And you'll watch the ones that are like, are dope, that people love, but like nobody's ever heard of. You know what I mean? Like the stuff that's like, you know, really like there's only dubs, you know, like it's all in Japanese, but you have to read the subtitles. <laughs> right. So I feel like that's where I am now, bro. It's like I've been reading a lot of like business books from like old business dudes. Like who? Give me so give me for, an, for an example. <laughs> all right. I'm going to, we're going to call the audible and we're going to, we're going to go to go. audible real quick. But like as an example, um, so like let's Vern. Let's compare audibles. Okay, bro. yeah, let's do it. So like, uh, do you know Vern Harnish? Yes. Uh, he wrote Scaling, Scaling Up. Up, and then yeah. he wrote Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Like those are books that I that I um, revisit Up, regularly. Great book. Yeah. So the first version of it's called Mastering <laughs> the Rockefeller Habits, and then he rewrote the Scaling Up. Okay. Um, so, but I've just been doing books. I've been th- shuffling through books. I typically try to listen to a book every night before I fall asleep. Every night? Yeah, so I'll I'll put on Audible, and I'll just do the timer on it. I'll do a 15 or 20-minute timer, and I'll just go to sleep and listen to a book. Nice. As an example. So just rant, bro. I have just like a ton of random stuff on here, and there's a bunch of stuff that I haven't started yet. I always feel like Hermosi's got great stuff to revisit. You know what I mean? Um, you almost interviewed him, right? I, I heard him. Could, are you able to talk about that story, what happened? Yeah, man. I was supposed to interview Hermosi. Long story short, I he missed one. And then I missed one, and then we just never did it again. Yeah. yeah. But, Where did I talk about that? That was Joshua's podcast. Okay, okay, okay. And okay. Uh, you, yeah. did, but he like hit you up and he was like, "Hey, bro, like you missed your chance." Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It was pretty funny, but yeah, yeah. I have a bunch of stuff on. You can feel free to. But yeah, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, let's see what I, I we have got. a bunch of random stuff. I, I have books on. Traction by Gino Wickman. Yeah. Predictable revenue. Oh yeah, this is like this is an entrepreneur's. Yeah, audience. and then but I have also random stuff. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Do you play tennis? No, it's that's like a mindset book. So I've been doing a lot of mindset stuff. I'm listening. I'm even listening to like dating books. I'm listening to like pickup book. Like I'm just kind of like exploring on books right now because like a lot of stuff you actually learn indirect business lessons from. Yeah. So I feel like it's actually a huge mistake that a lot of like agency owners, as an example, make. They just study agencies, and so for us, the way we did our pricing, I learned it from a cologne brand. Really? Yeah. So, so it's like. I'm big into cologne. I have like a huge cologne collection. Okay. Paul always makes fun of me because I have this massive cologne <laughs> collection. But yeah, there's a brand called Creed and they do the pricing really, really well. So like a 50 milliliter bottle is, let's just say, $250. And a 100 milliliter bottle is $400. So the more it goes up, the more you just say, okay, it's the best value if I just spend the most. But I had never really thought about iPhone does the same thing, but I guess I learned it from buying cologne. And then right. that's what we did. We did packages. And the more they scaled up, the incremental decrease they got in price. And it also was kind of a good price anchor as well. And Cologne has different utilities, right? You might want to get a small bottle if you're traveling on a plane and you're in Dubai and you can't fly with a big bottle of Cologne. You want to get a small one. So there's utility there, right? Mm. It's the same with agencies. Like you might want less leads if you're just starting your business as an example. So I think like, you know, we talked about it even a second ago where I said I learned a lot from SaaS businesses. I feel like you can learn so many business lessons from other stuff. So like thus, why I have a bunch of random books on there about yeah. random stuff. It's yeah. like, I feel like there's business lessons there. Even the Bible has a ton of good business lessons. Oh, so many. The most good business lessons. Even a lot of like personal development, like OG, like Dale Carnegie. and It all stems from the Bible. It all stems from the Bible. It all stems from the Bible. You know? There was a writer who wrote uh, something, I'm going through the Sermon on the Mount again, Matthew 5 through mm-hmm. 7. Uh, and there was some writer, I don't remember who it was, but he said something along the lines of like every speech ever written is just like every great speech, every great motivational speech is essentially the Sermon on the Mount, but optimized in a modern way, yeah. basically. Like that, it actually is the foundation of yeah. our society. Yes, yeah. that book. It's crazy. 100%. And dude, like other people do this as well, right? And they. That was an eagle. Oh, was it? Yeah. America. Yeah, it was a golden eagle. Let's go. America, baby. America. So Russell Brunson talks about an expert secrets where he says he studied a bunch of movements. Like yeah. cults, you know, other stuff that we can't say on YouTube, probably, you know, like uh, Christianity, um, Buddhism, yeah. all these other things. And so it's like he said that he learned a lot about creating a movement from studying mm. different uh, 
movements. Yeah. You know? So it's like, as an example, it's like, but nobody thinks about that. Yeah. You know, it's like, I want to create a movement for my software company. Well, let's see what they did for this big thing or that big thing. So it's like, I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of indirect lessons to be learned from other stuff that you can pull into your own business. Studying cults would be interesting. One day, I'd, I'd like to go and deep dive with different Yeah, that's cults, what he did. But I know John Lee does that too. She, te- she tells me all the time about how she studies different cults. Really? Yeah. That's a cult. Um, deer. Right we got deer back there too? Yeah. Yeah, bro, we get like, it's like a nature reserve here. Wow. It's, it's, it's beautiful. such a blessing, man. Um, okay, so what do you do outside of just work these days? I feel like you got some, I don't know, some, some interesting stuff. Really? Uh, yeah. Or are you a workaholic still? No, dude, I, I don't even look at it like that. I more so just look at it like I just enjoy working. And when yeah. I'm not working, it kind of almost feels like what do I do in a way. Yeah. So. Oh, I know it. Um, I'm big on food, bro. I love really? to like eat and go to different restaurants and things and try different stuff. So like when I got in last night, I was like, I want to go try like steakhouse, you know, which everyone has the most reviews or whatever. And I ended up doing that and it was great. And so I, I like that. I just like spend time with friends. I'm huge into UFC. Really? Big UFC fan, bro. Like okay. not a weekend goes by where I don't watch UFC. Interesting. Um, I don't know. I just enjoy. Do you watching. fight? No, not re- I mean, done Muay Thai and stuff like a little bit. And then I wrestled a little bit when I was a kid, but yeah. not like actively. Yeah. Yeah. The food. I want to touch on the food for a second. Just being able to go into a town and try the nicest steakhouse and just like, it doesn't even matter. That's something that I've gained so much appreciation for over the last couple of years of just like, I just, I, I don't want the crazy nice car. I don't want the super nice watch. I don't even want the nice clothes. But the comfortability of like, if I want to just get some nice food, if I want yep. to have a nice experience, I can do it and it not bat an eye yep. at a few hundred bucks. Yeah, I, I try to think do, about that every time. Do you feel that? I, like, do you reflect on that? I'm just like, man. 100%, dude. Yeah, I try to think about that every, I try to think about that every single time that I do it. It's like, man, this is really cool that I have the opportunity to be able to do this. Yeah. You know? And it's like, there's this always balance that you have to have between wanting more and being happy with what you have. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like if you always want more, you're never going to be happy. Yeah. And I think that's where I was for a long time was like I just want more, just want more, just want more. I don't give a crap about like, you know, I would almost have this mindset of like, okay, we just had a good month. We're not going to celebrate it because it doesn't mean anything to us. We need to do more, you know. And so now I don't, I'm not like that at all. I'm like, okay, a win is a win. You know, even if it's just going to enjoy a nice steak or whatever yeah. and it, that's a win, you know. If it's closing the biggest deal of my life that's also a win you know what i mean so yeah. i, I kind of that's how i try to look at it now but yeah bro 100 percent, dude it's like just some of the small things that like many people would never get to experience you know you got to be able to appreciate that stuff as well but when you're super ambitious you always just look up levels and levels and levels and you're like well this person's flying around on private jets but it's like there's also somebody looking at you thinking this person gets to eat a multi-hundred dollar meal and i don't even have money for for dinner yeah. as an example so it's you know the meme where it's like the guy in the Mercedes is looking at the guy in the Ferrari, like yeah. I want a Ferrari, and the guy in the Ferrari is looking at the guy in the private jet, and yeah. then there's also like a guy that's in like a, you know, Hyundai looking at the guy in the Mercedes, and, and then, then there's the a guy on a bike, street. and then there's a guy walking. So it's like there's always, that's the most real meme of like, you're always looking up, and you're never looking back, yeah. and like sometimes it's just best to, you know, like center yourself. So Such a good point. I, I made a video about this on YouTube, but... I was dry. I I have my office. I have like a little office where I live in Florida and it's in like a bougie area, like really nice kind of upscale, like beach area. And so there's a private airport there, like three minutes away from my office. And I was driving to work one day and I always see the planes go over and I saw a Gulf stream and I was like, kind of dude, for, this is sounds outrageous, bro. It's like, but I was for a Gulf stream. Gulf stream. It's a jet. Oh, like really a, nice it's a, like Grant Cardone's kind of jet, like okay. the one that he would have. And for a second, I'm like, "Woe is me, right? I don't have a Gulfstream." Yeah, you know, and it's like such an outrage. I feel yeah. actually bad even saying that. Like as a Christian, <laughs> I honestly feel like such an idiot saying something like that. But for like two seconds, that's like I was like, "Oh man!" Like I'm waking up early to go to work and like grind away, and this this dude's just flying around on his Gulfstream, you yeah. know, like doing whatever he wants. And then like not but two minutes later there's a homeless lady on the side of the street with all of her belongings in like one of those Costco totes, you know, like the little plastic bins. And it's like, dude, perspective. it's perspective, right? It's me looking at them 
and then it's it's uh, the the homeless person probably looking at me thinking I wish I had a car you know or whatever so it's like well you got to yeah you have to appreciate you ha- you want to strive for more but you want to also appreciate all the things that you have yeah you know it reminds me of what Paul says in the bible he says do not associate with those who view godliness as a means of gain mm. not that godliness is not gain but godliness with contentment is great yeah. gain and like that's it it's it's well, it's kind of like prosperity gospel, 20, right? I, not, not, yeah, not, not. Pro, I don't think about it as prosperity gospel. I think it, of it as it's a calling to the gain is being the person, and and things will come to you. But the actual gain, the actual value, the actual thing that you're seeking is just being the person that you want to be. And if you can do that with contentment and not need the extra things, mm. but you can just be that person with contentment. That actually is the greatest gain. Yeah. Uh, that's how I interpret it. At yeah, least. one hundred percent. Yeah, but that's such a good reminder because, dude, this is a big thing I've been going through in the last few weeks. To be honest with you, like I, my entire life for the last six years, John, it's just been how can I make more money? How can I increase my monthly revenue? How can I get? In a lot of ways, you said you were just very honest with with us. So I'll be very honest too with the with the audience. In a lot of ways, it's like, it's always been how can I become the most successful person my age in the world like that's that's, that's dope, where my though. mind goes yeah like but it's was... like you have it's like you know that meme where you have like a hat on and there's a carrot and you're just yeah, running yeah. after the <laughs> yeah. carrot but that's you're the one is. pushing the carrot forward that's what it is yeah. it's like when i was 21 it's like i wanted to be i wanted to have the highest monthly revenue of any 21 year old on youtube it's so ter- it feels terrible to say it is it's misled it's, it's competitive it's ignorance prideful Prideful. I, I think prideful. I think it's. I think it's worse than competitive. Mm. Unfortunately. Yeah, because I think being competitive is a good thing. It is. But it yeah, is. prideful in is. A, in a right you gotta way. ask why though. I think that's a more important question because it's like, why did you want to be the most, the biggest person on YouTube? Insecurity. It had to have been insecurity. So then that's where the issue like kind of stems from. But that's and, where pride you know, comes from. Exactly. Pride, pride comes from not being secure enough in who we are because we don't know our identity. Yeah. We actually don't know who we are. And everybody in this world is just trying to figure it out and define for themselves who they are when it's actually already been defined. Yep. And they don't create their identity. They realize their identity. Mm. And that's where like the relationship with God changes you. And that's a big thing I've been having to go through now is literally shedding off the desire for the world, shedding off the desire for being the most successful person that I can compared to everybody financially in some weird arbitrary way. Shedding that off to say, well, who am I actually? What's actually going to fulfill my soul? Mm-hmm. What am I actually here for? It's like you're yeah. trying to fill this hole in your heart. Yeah. We all have this hole in our heart. We try totally. to fill it with money and then cars and then women and then followers. Yep. And it didn't matter what I put in that hole. Like It just was empty. And it just was always empty and it never got filled. And then when I encountered the love of God, I was like, oh, wow. Like this is yeah. the only thing that can actually fill this hole. Yeah, 100%, dude. I got to so, go. I was reading this last night, so I'm... I gotta pull up the phone here so I can don't get fact checked in the uh, comments. But <laughs> in Ecclesiastes, right? That's what Solomon is talking about. Yeah, is like all is vanity. All is vanity, right? Yeah. But I think the hard lesson is it's easy for you and I to say that, and somebody's gonna listen to that and be like, "Well, you know, Matt didn't love it, but I'm I'm still gonna try." Oh, it's always yeah. It's Oof. something where you kind of it's one of those. It's kind of like the thing with the software. I had to get smacked in the face with the software even though everybody else told me. Yeah. It's kind of funny to bring this, like, kind of close out this loop. But it's like, dude, everyone told me. People that were far more successful than me and older than me and more experienced than me and, like, superior to me in a lot of ways, don't do the software. But I'm just like, nah. Like, I, I've, I have proven people wrong before. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm going to do the software. But it's like, again, some people are going to have to feel and go do all that stuff to realize it's not what they want. You know what I mean? Because that's the thing. Like, it doesn't matter how many times I say on this podcast, money won't fill your soul. It's it, the comment is always easy for you to say you have money. Mm. You're right. You're right. If I didn't have money, I probably would just be like, I need money. That's exactly where. That's exactly what it was. I didn't. And it's what separated me from God so much. I heard a preacher in Miami say God's number one competitor in America is money. Mm. He's so right. People, it's because money is the God. It's an idol. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an Jesus idol. It's why Jesus says you can't serve both God and money. Yep. And it's why money is the God of America. It really is. Yeah. And it's scary. Yeah, 100%, dude. It is. Um, what, on this topic of faith, what, uh, if you're cool with talking about this, I know you said you're an open book. Oh, dude, so, I talk about anything. Yeah, genuinely. You can go. ask me any question. I I'll love ask. that. That's, like, that's, that's the best for a podcast. What... 
what does your faith mean to you? What um what is your walk like right now? And uh, how, yeah, how's it changed? How's it changed you? Because you said you've been getting more into it over the yeah. last couple of years, and there seems to be a crisis of meaning in the world right now, the yeah. modern world, where people are desiring something deeper, and mm-hmm. faith is obviously usually the go-to uh, thing to, to yeah. latch onto there. Dude, I've felt personally just like re- my my mom is like actually one of my like most um, meaningful like Christian mentors, wow. and my mom my mom says that the um, the eye of the Christian is the bullseye. So basically meaning like, or something along these lines. Sorry, mom. But basically meaning if you feel like under attack, that means that you're growing as a Christian. Mm. If you feel like under attack by the enemy, right? So it's like somebody that's maybe like newer in their faith, you know, you feel super convicted as an example when you sin, you know, and you're like, I don't want it. But if you, if you maybe been in it a long time and you're not as serious about it, you might not feel as convicted, yeah. which is bad. You yeah. know, that means that the enemy is like kind of taking hold on you, right? And so for me, bro, I've just felt very like spiritually attacked for the last few years. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. I just think that there's so many just evil. There's, I just feel like there's a lot of evil in the world right now. Like I just think there's so much evil. And um, I just feel like if you're a Christian, you're under attack. You know, like with just, even with like social media to an extent, even with, you know, uh, kind of the world we live in where I don't know how much we want to talk about, but like, you know, with porn and with like a lot of you know all these sorts of things and like a lot of men now are not even um incentivized to even go like meet a woman and have a family and these kind of things and it's like all these uh, you know not to sit here and everybody is always complaining about how awful the world is when they're in the world you know i'm sure that a thousand years ago they were all complaining about how awful things were then as well but i just feel Mm -hmm. like right now there is like a deliberate attack on like young christian men you know, just in general. And I just feel that a lot. Like, I, I don't know why. I, I internalize things a lot typically, and I think I just have felt that way. And so to me, the only natural response to that is get closer to God, you know, because it's like the closer you are to God, the less, you know, or the more you're, I guess, sheltered from the attack, you 100%. know. So that, I think that's kind of what been what it is. And also, I just think I've learned a lot. I think that I had to gain a lot of perspective. Yeah. I think similar to you, like, I felt like money was such an idol for me and success was such an idol for me and it was never enough and these sorts of things and didn't really make me super happy, you know? And so I had to get closer to, to, to God to know like, okay, this is what actually is going to fulfill me and is going to make me happy. Yeah. But I also just feel like there's just like a lot of spiritual attacks right now in America specifically 100%. on like young Christian men or just young men in general. I don't have to be Christian, but I just feel like there's a lot of terrible stuff out there that's, you know, very, uh, you know, easy to fall. Prey to. There is. There, there seems to me to be evil on all sides. Mm. Um, and I think we internalize it through our lens of, as young Christian men, like we see our evil. Uh, quite honestly, everybody's a victim of spiritual warfare. Mm. The people who don't believe are actually the greatest victims. Yep. Um, because they're... So they're losing the game them. and they don't even know they're playing the right. game. Yeah. It's they're, they're, yeah. The plane is crashing and they don't even know the plane is crashing. Right. Um, but knowing that there's darkness means has there has light. to be light. So has this strengthened your faith? Yes. Yeah. Oh, dude, absolutely, bro. Absolutely. But I mean, look, it does. there is a lot in the Bible that God's not going to give you more than you can handle. So I actually think sometimes having a lot on your plate is actually a sign from God that like, hey, yes. you're... You know, you can be trusted with more, right? Hundred percent. So I think that it's actually, to me, if anything, it's it's reaffirming. Honestly, yeah, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's not. You know, it's just like even with a to bring it back to agency for a sec. It's like it should be kind of hard to scale an agency. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you and I wouldn't appreciate what we did. You know, like it was just easy, and we just both flipped a switch, and we just were making you know millions of dollars just like that. Then like it wouldn't even been that cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's great perspective. Like, so I think about it like that. Embrace the challenge. Expect the challenge. Mm. And then you won't be so thrown off when things get hard. But you're mm. like, no, this is actually what makes it worth it in the first place. Yeah. One hundred percent, dude. It's like in Call of Duty, right? If you just played like easy mode and you played against all the bots. Yeah. And then they just they're like running it's the up worst. and you're just it's shooting. The worst. But then when you're like getting like, you know, 360 no scoped by some dude on a private in like a in a like a online lobby or whatever you're like 
okay, I know I'm getting beat, but it is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's like, but then when you go back and get him, finally. it's like, yes, you yeah. know, we finally freaking did it. Like yes, there's, the, sexy. there's the, the fulfillment of it. So that's the way that I think about that, bro. It's like, okay, well, at the end of the day, it is supposed to be hard. This stuff is supposed to be hard because if it wasn't, then nobody would appreciate it. Yeah, thousand percent. What what do you what do you see in the world right now that you would want your younger self to have been aware of? Mm -hmm. Like what's what's something you would have pointed out to your younger self, let's say five years ago, that uh, somebody listening to this can be aware of? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I obviously like think if you're being called in that way, like lean into your faith. You know, I wish I would have done that more earlier on. I feel like I would have, you know, everything would have just been smoother in life. Maybe not, you know, but it's also like I think that I would have just had a lot more perspective in general. So I think that, like, you know, if you are feeling called in, like, your faith, lean more into your faith. Because ultimately, right, it's like, to me, that's the most important thing that you can have rather than, like, making a bunch of money or whatever. Like, if if you don't have that, then I think you're missing a lot. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses, loses his, his own soul. soul? Right. Yeah. So I feel the same way. I like that's to me is wholehearted truth, just like the whole Bible. You know, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to believe that the Bible is entirely true, which you know is like that. That is especially true. So um, I think that, and I also just think, dude, like I think it, you know, just be super humble, because I don't know about you, Matt, but I remember when I hit 10, 15k a month. It's like the Kanye song, Can't Tell Me Nothing. You know? <laughs> That's how I felt, bro. 10, 15K a month. I'm like, I am the shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I am yeah. the man. Everywhere I go, everybody should just get out of my way because I'm the man. And it's like 10, 15K a month. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. and then when I got to like 150-ish, I realized I know nothing. Yeah. yeah. Nothing. It's so funny. It's and I'm like, 100%. And so I even see this right now with, with, um, my consulting business. It's like the guys that come in are at 20, 30 K a month. They are like, they think they're, they know everything. And the guys that are at like 200, 250, they have a lot of humility. Yep. It, it, Jesus talks about it in Matthew, right? Uh, about, you know, having the childlike humility. Yeah. Right. It's just like another business lesson. Yeah. It's like, that's kind of what you have to have. Always be learning, you know? Yeah. So it's like Sam Walton, right? You know, when he got uh, arrested in Mexico, do you know the story? No. Really? No, no, no. Oh, dude, you're going to love this one. Okay. He's got a good book, by the way. You should read it. It's called Made in America. Made in America. Yeah. Good. I've read yeah. it, but okay. I don't remember the story. I think they story. might have talked about it a little bit. But he's in some hole-in-the-wall grocery store in Mexico. Mm. And he's on the ground measuring out how far the shelves are apart from each other. And he got arrested because they were like, this guy's like crazy or something. But that shows you that this guy's a billionaire. He's humble enough to go in the hole-in-the-wall Mexican grocery store and like see if they know something that he doesn't know. Like, yeah. bro. Yeah. Even he's a billionaire and realizes, like, I can learn from anyone. That's so good. You know? It's so so I, I kind of think this exact same way, bro. It's like, you know, I, I don't see things as like, oh, somebody's going to learn from, you know, this person or that. I, I look at it like you can literally learn from everyone. And even if it's not, it's what not to do, right? You can yeah. still get gain perspective from that. So I think, like, I would tell everybody just be a sponge. Yes. But be mm -hmm. able to throw stuff out and be able to say like, hey, maybe this is not the best thing for me right now. Hey, maybe this is. Because there are also, the problem with being a sponge is there are a lot of people just yapping and saying a whole lot of nothing online. That's why you need discernment. You need discernment. You need self-awareness. Yep. But I think it was Einstein who said everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life thinking it's an idiot. Yeah. So that's, that's a good one. if you can see people the right way, you, there's a lesson to be learned from everyone, even yeah. if it's a lesson on what not to do. Yep. So I love that advice. It's so good. It reminds me of another thing Jesus says where he says, exalt yourself and you'll be humbled. Humble yourself and you'll be exalted. exalted yeah. It's like, that's it. It's Humility is the genesis of exaltation because you have to start low with the child's mind to learn what it takes to yep. actually be brought up. So I think that's some of the ac most sound advice that's actually ever been shared on this podcast. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Oh, thank you, and, brother. Uh, do you want to talk about the copywriting? Do you want to keep that DL? I, here's my thing. I have a rule about stuff like this is that I just know how fast business can change. So I don't like to talk about anything until yeah. it's – because if not, then you 
it kind of goes, I know we're talking about the Bible, and now we're going to talk about, like, the antithesis of the Bible, but 48 laws of power. It's like, it talks about how the more you say, the more you open yourself up to look stupid. Well, the Bible talks about that, too. Solomon talks about how, uh, oh, man, I wish I could remember the exact verse, but something along the lines of, something along the lines of what you just said. Like, in an abundance of words, there is strife or yep. something like that, you know, in his Solomon way. Yeah. Um, but in, in few words, there is wisdom or something like that, right? And yep. It also says in the New Testament, be slow to speak, quick to listen. Yep. Um, yeah. Quick to understand. Yeah, Adam and I used to talk about this a lot. Like, he would be like, hey, bro, I, I might have felt like you kept this for me or you didn't tell me. And I'd just be like, I just don't like to talk about stuff until it's, you know, if it's on a personal level. Then There's it, power in that. Yeah. But it's, if it's you know, still get, because business changes so quickly, dude. You know what I mean? Like, if somebody would ask you two years ago what you would be doing, like, what you would have said then might be a lot different than it looks now. I know, at least for me, that's yeah. definitely the case. You know? If, so. That's why I like working in silence. Like, just shutting up and just grinding. Yep. And then, they'll know you by your fruit. Exactly. And then one day, people just see. Yep. Oh, shoot. And you actually, you don't have to talk about it. Yep, you just show you just it. just did it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it is when you can just, like you said, you have the fruits to bear of like, hey, I've done this before. So, yeah. And I, I think in time, everybody, but I also think there's a, there is some strength into like not showing your hand and kind of being, I agree, you know, and letting, I mean, I even know, you know, a lot of the people that I know that are super well off and super big on social, like they only show a small percentage as well. You know, it's like yeah. they do, you know, have some stuff that they don't like talking about or like showing and I think that's good because I don't think you're like I can only imagine being uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as an example oh. where you know you date this girl and then they're investigating her and then they're calling well, this out well because she's 18 and you're okay. 50 that's fair <laughs> but it's still like it's still weird to be under a microscope because yeah, hey is. we all have we all have our, our demons right. we all have our, our stuff but it's like we've all fell short exactly and so it's like no one person should be publicized or openly crit but it, when you get on social and do these things like you open yourself up to that yeah. and and also like people want to I think there's a mix of like people are amazing there's a lot of people that are amazing like I met some amazing people but there's also some the opposite of that right and so it's like also another thing is like you some people do want to like, there is people out there that don't want to see Matt Shields do well you know oh, what yeah. I mean and there is people out there that don't want to see John Danes do well. So I also find that like it is kind of a superpower to be able to not talk about every single thing That's that you point. do. You know, because I, I think there's some benefit to that. You know, like even when Elon was buying Twitter, he kind of like said he was going to do it and then he backed out. He's kind of playing mind games with everybody. Mm. And I think that's kind of cool. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like I think that's kind of smart to not always be telegraphing. Yeah. Especially the bigger you get. The Unless there's an intent for it. So like Explain. if when you're working on appointment wise and you, you know, are launching a new feature and you think that talking about this new feature is going to help you get more clients. Yeah. Like then it makes sense. But if it's just saying to say, and it's not really, yeah, all it is is to stroke your own ego. That's then a good it, point. You know, but if it's like you're promoting your business, then dude, that's fine. You know yeah. what I mean? But like for me to talk about that, it doesn't not really going to do much, you know, to, to say that, right. To talk about the, the agency stuff. So, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I, I made a video on this a few months back and one of the, it was like four, four keys to make money or something like that. And one of the keys was stop talking about your goals because when you talk about a goal, you release the same type of chemical dopamine. You release dopamine when you talk about the goal you release the same chemical as when you actually achieve the goal. So you trick your brain mm, to thinking you into did. thinking that you're actually achieving the goal when you're not. Wow. It's the same thing that, that masturbation is to having actual intercourse. You're giving yourself the illusion that you've actually done it, done the thing that you're yeah, wow. actually desiring. And it's the same thing with talking about your goals. It's literally mental math. That's why it's mental masturbation. Yeah. It's the same exact thing. Yeah, dude, that's, I never, that's crazy. That's a new perspective. That's awesome. That yeah, makes sense. I also think too, is that you have a lot of people around you that are doubters, like doubting Thomases, and when yeah. you say too much, they might crush you. 
with their words. You know what I mean? So you might say. Or they can fuel you. They, you can do both. It's a mix of both. 100%, dude. So, yeah, exactly. But as but I guess. Too much so, doubt is. Harmful. Yeah. But like some level of doubt is good. Yeah. You know, because I, like, I, had, I got a 17 on my ACT. I did horrible in school. I got, you know, I had a turbulent school path. Everybody kind of thought like, you know, I wasn't like the valedictorian or like, so nobody would have been like, he's going to be the guy, you know, that does well or whatever. And so that fueled me a ton, Same. you know, is yeah. to go and kind of do that and, and to win. And I think that is a good, you know, that's a good driver. Yeah. But it depends what you're, it depends the way you see yourself, bro. Yeah. So, so yeah, keep going. Have you seen how these people are doing this uh, like thing where they're like chat GPT roast my Instagram? Have you seen this? No. So these people are doing this thing where they're like chat GPT roast my Instagram. And some people are like offended about, about it because it gives like a pretty honest like roast. And I'm like, you're offended because you know it's true. Yeah. You know, so if chat GPT is saying, hey, you look like a douchebag on Instagram, you know that you look like a douchebag. You know, and now you're battling with am I a douchebag? You know what I mean? So it's like, that's that, I think that's the kicker because if somebody tells, you know, me at 18 who has so much belief that I'm going to make it work, that it won't work, it's fuel. But if I have levels of doubt or if I actually don't really believe it's going to work and somebody tells me it's going to work, that can sink me. So it also, I think it depends on your like personal levels it of depends. conviction. But if you have doubt, so the, here's the question is if you have doubt, like if you don't have enough belief to overcome other people's doubt. Is it really the right thing for you to be doing anyway? Yeah. You have doubt because you know deep down that it's actually the wrong thing. Like, similar example to you, when I said I wasn't going to college and I'm going to buy this course and I'm going to start a marketing agency from my laptop with no degree or education or anything, everybody doubted me. Yeah. Every, like every single person I remember telling. My mom cried. Really? My brother laughed. My dad didn't do either of those things, but he was definitely worried. I could tell he was really worried. My friends laughed. My friends' parents, I could tell, were judging me. I would like come up from the sleepover in the morning to get breakfast, and, and they'd say, like, so where are you going? What are you doing with your life? And I'm like, well, I'm going to start a marketing agency. And they'd be like, oh, so no college visits? Yeah. <laughs> like, nope. And But, wow. oh, I felt it. I was just like, it fueled you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. And it's pride. But here's what I've, here's what I've reflected on. Because pride is the sin of all sins. It is the ultimate evil. Yep. But there is, it can be used for good. It can, it can be used for good. I want, to be, I want to be careful on how I say this. It can be used for good for a time, but ultimately it's supposed to lead you to a different source of motivation, which is love. And that's, that's what Jesus embodies is he says there's no greater love than this to lay your life down for one's friends. And then he goes and he lays his life down. So my motivation now has been in a tough spot, John, because I had this pride, I had this doubt, and I was like, this is gonna fuel me. I wanna prove everyone wrong. And I did, like, I did it, it, it happened. The thing I wanted that I thought was gonna make me fulfilled mm. happened. But then, after that, I'm still unfulfilled. I'm not fulfilled in having proved them wrong. Yeah, because you were learning that it doesn't mean anything. Right. Be this is why you don't care about having a nice car, because you understand that, who you get the nice car for, the valet at the restaurant? Right. It's like. You don't desire to have a nice car. There are some people that genuinely, they love cars and they desire to have a nice That's how I am with the watches. I love watches. Yeah. But it's like, if you get a watch, you're not doing it for Matt. No. You're doing it to impress some no. random person exactly. who doesn't even care in the first place. Exactly. So, yeah. And so, so then there, there is a, a hierarchy of motivation, right? And pride is probably somewhere in the middle. But the ultimate source of motivation is actually love. Yep. And so where I'm at now, the challenge has been... If I tell somebody my goals, they don't doubt me. They say, oh, yeah, we, we doubted you in the past and we learned. So yeah. we're going to believe, believe in you, you even now. if it's a crazy goal. So now it's there's some people who will doubt, but the people that I really care about don't. They're going to they're gonna believe in me. So now I need this new source of motivation because no one's doubting me. So what else can I revert to? But what if I don't make it about me at all? What if I make it about them? Yeah. What if I do it for them? What if I do it out of servitude? What if I do it out of love? And... To me now, I'm seeing that's actually the greatest source of motivation is love. It's actually yep. greater than pride. The problem is it's hard to get a place. It's hard to get to a place of pure love yeah. as motivation because pride is always creeping in. Yeah. Because we haven't died to ourselves. Yep. I have a friend here who's a missionary in Charlotte, and 
He's, he's always telling me about how we have to die to ourselves. It's the root of Christianity, If really. we want God to live in us, we first have to die. Mm -hmm. And it's... Ooh, it's the thing I'm trying to go through now is death to Matt Shields. Like I want somebody to say my name and I like don't even I don't even realize they're talking to me yeah. at first because I'm just so not living for myself. I'm not living yeah. for my own success. And it's hard because the world of agencies, the world of the online business cult is the opposite. It's like me, me, you, me. It's pride. It's yeah. it's just it's just like the pride movement in the business world in yeah. a way. It's just its own twisted form of pride. Yeah. So Yeah, one hundred percent. And you, you know, make it about others, you know, that's the, yeah. that's the way to truly, you know, like, like people know, like Mother Teresa as an example, because she literally helped so many freaking people, you know, like she probably helped more people than any single person ever. Yeah, directly. You know what I mean? Directly, right? Um, directly, for sure. So like she, cause she died herself. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's like, because it, it wasn't about her, as an example. Yeah. You know? She didn't even do it, like, publicly. Yeah. Like, people found out she was doing it. She was helping all these people in need. And yep. then God glorifies whom he wants, right? And yep. he chose her because he saw his her heart. He was like, all right, then I know you don't need the glorification, yep. so I'll, I'll, I'll show people yeah. how I'm working through it. And that. indirectly, like, that's how people become notable figures is by helping other people. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's interesting because it's like, she is now like a, or, you know, is, is somebody that's going to live on, you know, even though she's gone. It's like she lives on because of all the impact that she made, mm. you know. And it was, and it was a necessity for her to not desire to want to live on in order for, it's a weird paradox. Yeah, yeah. The well, more you want legacy, the harder it is to get. Exactly. And I think that's a lot of stuff, right? It's right. like. Right, backwards the, law. Yeah. The more you like, you know. It's even like with agency, I feel like almost the best thing you can do is just like attach, like unattach yourself from the outcome and just attach yourself to the process. Yeah. Because then it's like you're going to, you're going to actually get to the outcome faster because you're mm. focused on the process. Mm. Focus on the actual actions. That's a, that's such a good point because everybody's focusing on 100K a month. Yeah. How can I get there? How can I get to this amount of money rather than just what do I actually need to do today? To get there tomorrow. Dude, this sounds crazy, but I didn't even look at my, like, revenue all that often. Really? I looked all the time. I didn't. Because I, I kind of felt like I might get this feeling of, like, you know, being, like, well, you know, I would check it, you know, every couple months or so. But it was, like, I didn't really care because I was just focused on, like, just, I know if we just show up every single day that the revenue is going to come. Hmm. And so, like, I think that's what mm. just freaks out a lot of people. It's like, what if I do this and it doesn't work? And it's like, we'll just do it. You know what I mean? Because, like, it will work if you do it for long enough. For a sustained period of time, if you do what you know you should be doing, which is pretty simple, then you're going to have the success. It might not, like, I was fortunate to see it pretty quickly. Like, we did well pretty quickly. You did well very quickly as well. But it's like, all that is just showing up every single day and just doing the stuff that you need to be doing. Yeah. You know, like, are, did we have more success because we're, like, hyper geniuses and we're so much smarter than everybody else? No, I just think we just probably did ten times more than everybody else. Mm, just more volume. Where did, where did that come from? Why do you think you were able to do more than others? I mean, if you look at sports, right, like, that's the best learning of this. It's like, do you ever see those videos of LeBron and he's, like, in his backyard shooting baskets in his backyard? Mm, it's like, yeah. It's like LeBron, dude. He never, never could shoot a basketball again and be fine. Yeah. But he's still doing it every single day, even though he is the best. You know, and they, I think they said something similar about Kobe Bryant. It's like 100%. every single day, show up, show up, show up, show up, show up, show up. Yeah. So I just think that that, like, I don't know. And I also think that so many people, dude, are very, like, what if I do it and it doesn't work out? Or what if I try something and it doesn't work. And I just never really thought that way. I thought like, even if it doesn't work, I'm still gonna learn a lot of valuable skills that are gonna serve me later on. I feel like everybody's just in too big of a hurry. And I feel like you have to be in this perfect mix of being like in no rush at all, but also being in a hurry. Because you don't wanna be in no rush and you're like, okay, well, I'll wait till tomorrow and then you procrastinate. But you also don't wanna be in this position where you're like, oh, I'm not there where I wanna be yet. I need to give up, I need to quit, etc. And also like, I think that I took it incredibly serious as well. 
And I think that a lot of people, when if they're honest with themselves, they're not taking it as serious as they maybe should. Like I, Adam and I took it incredibly serious. Like it was a, Same. you know, it was a very serious thing for us. And it wasn't like, so there wasn't even doubts of like, well, what if it doesn't work out? Because we just took it so seriously, yeah. Yeah. you know? And it sounds like faith. It really does. It, it sounds, is faith. It sounds like the, the difference maker is faith. That people don't take it seriously because deep down they don't actually believe, believe. it's going to work. They don't go really hard. They don't put in the inputs because they, they don't have enough faith that the output's going to come back to them. It's like Hermosi says, if I could guarantee in the next 10 years, if you just work 50 hours a week consistently for 10 years straight on the same thing, after that I'll, have, I'll hand you a million dollars guaranteed tax-free. Like, would you take it? Most people are like, yeah, I take it. I take the million dollars. Or maybe it's five years, he says. Five years, you're yeah. a millionaire. And it's like, well, if everybody says yes to that question, or if most people, I would have I would have said no. I would have said, you know, I want to get it faster than five years. But if most people would say yes, I would take the trade if I just simply have to put in the input, then it's like, well, what's the thing blocking them from just doing that? The belief. It has to be a belief. Yeah, people yeah. have this, like, fallacy of, well, the way, but here's the way I, I think I saw it in a very humble way, which was, what else am I going to do? How do you mean? So, like, I didn't have other some options. other options. Same. I didn't have big opportunities. I didn't have, like, you know, some family business that I could just go be a part of and be fine. Like, it, it was like this or community college. So, it's also being able to analyze what are the actual opportunities. Because a lot of people are like, well, agency's not the best move. Uh, or like, I don't know if it's worth it to sit there, hunker down and focus on the agency or whatever business it is for a year. And, but it's like, okay, well then what else are you going to do? Community college, go work a normal job. And not there's anything wrong with that. So like, you know, that's okay. But it's like agency was the best option. So that's why I took it so seriously because I didn't have another option that was better. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's why Just to me. Just do or die. Just do or die. And I think that's like all cool stories are put your back up against the wall and go for it. You know, like that's, yeah. that's some of the best, that's all the best stories really. So it's like, I think that I didn't have, like, I, I think it's an arrogance dude of like, well, you know, what if I do this for a year and it doesn't work out or whatever? It's like, dude, that's anything in life. There's variables with anything that you do. You know what I mean? Like, so I didn't see it from that. Like, I think that's just a very cynical and selfish way of yeah. seeing it. And I didn't see it that way. I saw it like, okay, I have endless opportunities here. The variable is just I got to do the stuff that I need yeah. to do. Yeah, that's such a good point. And the fulfillment of getting better every single day. And also just celebrating like the small wins, you know? So it's like some people are like, I haven't got my first client yet. But it's like, well, dude, like. You got a meeting. You got a meeting, you know. You got you a got, free trial. You got a free Maybe. trial. You got somebody that responded to one of your emails. It's like that's all it is, dude. It's just can you get to the next level? It's just you got to look at it as like a hundred level game. Yep. And you just take the steps. And if you just take those steps, like I made something. I made a 74-step SOP to build a 100K a month agency. It's just like almost like gamified it. Yep. Just if you just do this, you follow this path, you check these off, you'll get there. Mm -hmm. And but people think it's one step. Yeah, people think it's one thing. But one it's thing seventy-four. Happens, and it's yeah, it's seventy-four. Million. And that's what people don't like. Like people don't think that way. They just they just see the result. But yeah. I actually think the process is the coolest part. And I wonder if this is the same for like a billion-dollar business too. It's got to be right. Yeah. Just it, brick by brick. Engineer brick by brick. That's it's like building a house. You know, yeah. it's like the house doesn't just build, it's not just done. You have to lay the foundation, you have to, yeah. you know, trim the land. Like you have to do all kinds of stuff, right? So it's like, it's the agency is the same way, but people, dude, we just live in such an instant gratification world where there's just so much dopamine and there's just so much hits of dopamine that you can get instantly. And like building a business is not like instant dopamine. You know, it's it's prolonged. It's the opposite. It's, yeah, it's, it's complete instant opposite. suffering. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> right? you have to persevere through. Exactly, but it's worth it. It is. To some people. Yeah. To some people. Um, and if it's not, then you do it and you figure out it's not for you. Yeah. You know, like that's another thought. It's like you try an agency for a year and you realize it's not for you. My, my immediate thought was like, bro, what else would you be doing? Right. I couldn't you know, think of anything. So it's like you're going to go work a normal job or you're going to go to college or whatever. And that's for some people. But it's like if that's not for you, then like worst case, like I did a gap year, you know, for college. It's like, I'm going to do a gap year. And then it's like, we got a little bit, I got a little bit of traction and stuff with like my podcast within a year. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to continue doing this, you know? 
and then it built into the agency and all the other stuff. So it's just like, dude, people just want too much instant gratification. And the more you delay it, like the more you're eventually going to get what you want. But the problem is this is not like sexy advice. No, nobody wants to hear it. But it, we can bring it back to Ecclesiastes for a second because you mentioned that book earlier. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible because it's just so existential. It's so stoic in nature and it's just such a fascinating read. It's like almost like why is this in the Bible? Yeah. As you mentioned, Solomon is perceiving all these things. He's perceiving wealth. He's perceiving fame. He's perceiving uh, women and concubines as the most successful man who's ever lived. Yep. Like he has more things and people to serve him than anyone who's ever existed. And so he is in this unique spot of having everything that everybody's ever wanted. He actually has. Mm -hmm. And what's the conclusion he comes to when he looks at them? He says it's vanity. Yep. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Everything's vanity under the sun. And a striving after wind. I, try, I always think about literally somebody chasing wind, trying to grab onto wind. Like that's what he's saying. You're trying to grab something that can't be grabbed. But the conclusion he comes to at the end of the book is, there, this is this is essentially the purpose of life. This is this is the essence for man is to enjoy his toil and honor his God. Yep. Enjoy his toil, and just enjoy the work is what he says. The outcome's vanity, but it's the process. It's the building. Mm. It's something I've heard uh, this guy, Doctor Frank Turk, always say. He says he's a Christian apologist, and I have one of his books somewhere around here. He lives actually in Weddington, which is like ten minutes from here. So we've been able to meet him a couple oh, that's times. Awesome. Something he always says is this world is a terrible gymnasium. Or this world is a terrible home, but it's a damn good gymnasium. Mm. Like this world is actually training grounds for the next one. Yep. For the next life. It's not, this is not our dwelling place. Mm. So with that in mind, you don't get attached to outcomes in the world because you know those outcomes are impermanent. Yep. But the toil and the training is what you fall in love with. Mm. And that's consistent with every great philosophy the, the Buddhists, the Stoics, the Samurais, it's all about training and developing yourself. It's not about the outcome itself. Um, and I want to I dive deeper into your, your faith if we can. Yeah, just, please, bro. Maybe we finish on this note. Cool. Why do you think, why do you, because you grew up Christian. Yep. Uh, you grew up with this, this belief. And in the last few years, you've taken it more seriously. Why do you think from your perspective, people don't believe in God? I'm curious the Christian perspective on this because my my thought is well I can just say why I didn't believe in God because I I grew up on the different end of the the spectrum. Yep. But what is the Christian view from your perspective? Um, Speaking on behalf of all Christianity, <laughs> I don't actually believe that anybody has a problem with Jesus. I feel like people have a problem with Christians. Hundred percent. And I feel like Christians drive away potential Christians more than potential Christians drive away themselves. Yeah. So, like, I, I, that's my thought. Because anything that you add humans to becomes imperfect because humans are imperfect. Mm. Right? So it's like the church, you know, has been perverted by humans because we're humans. We're imperfect. So it's like Jesus was perfect, and the more... You know, human element is added to Christianity the more things change. You know, and it's like a lot of it becomes harder for people to actually, mm. you know, follow Jesus because they might see other people. Because, like, I grew up right in, like, the South, like, the Bible Belt, etc. What's you the Bible Belt? You never heard this expression? No. They call it, like, the basically the part of the U.S. that's, like, heavily Christian. Really? Yeah. So what, what area would that be? That'd it's like, be like Tennessee, Alabama, probably even somewhat here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah they call it the Bible here. Belt, right? Okay, makes sense. But, you know, you meet a lot of people that call themselves Christians, but it also says in the Bible that, you know, Jesus is going to tell a lot of people that he never knew them. You know, so it's like, I think mm -hmm. that Christianity gets a bad rap because of Christians sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, but... Because we are imperfect. But I, I think that a lot of people don't fundamentally understand Christianity. Christianity is not, you're not a Christian because you're perfect. You're actually a Christian for the opposite reason because you are flawed. But Jesus is perfect. Right? And so I think that people don't understand that. People think like, oh, 
you know, they're Christians, so they think they're better than me. No, it's actually... Not if they're really a Christian. Right. Exactly. So I think that's what throws people off from Christianity, dude. It's like, even you said earlier, you know, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to say who specifically, but you said somebody you know, right? Got thrown off by the church. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so it's nothing that Jesus did. It's the church. The church, right. you know, it, um, threw them off and what we, what we were saying before. So it's like, that's, I think that's the biggest thing is because people see Christians as like these perfect people that are, you know, going around and telling everyone how to live and all these sorts of things. But it's like, they're not perfect. I'm imperfect. I make mistakes. I'm not the model Christian, you know, Jesus mm. is the model Christian. But it's like, also, I mean, think about in the Bible, how many people did Jesus use that were, you know, by the human accord, horrible, you know, Paul murdered Christians, dude. Yeah. You know, so it's like when he was Saul and then he became Paul and then, you know, now he, if you look at it, he's really like, you know, one of the most notable figures in the Bible, you know, Jesus used him for amazing things. So I think that's what it is, dude. I think that's the truth. But I think the thing that's always attracted me at Christianity is it is the only religion or where he comes to us. Yeah. Where we don't go to him. That's such a good point. Because we we can't, like, there is no amount of works or acts that are going to make us not flawed. Yeah. Right? So it's like if we have, like, some charcoal, and I just sprinkle a little bit of charcoal in this water, it's going to be gray. The more I put, it's going to be black. I look at us the same way. It's like, this is Jesus, but if there's a little bit of charcoal in here, that's us. Like, And I might have more charcoal than you, or you might have more than me, but we're still tainted, mm. right? We're still imperfect. Yeah. So it's like, that's the way that I think about it. It's like, we're Christians because we're imperfect. Yeah. And being Christians doesn't make us perfect. Jesus yeah. was perfect, you know? So... so that's my thought, dude. That's the way I think about it. I think mm. a lot of people are thrown off by church and by Christian people and not necessarily thrown off by Jesus. You're so right. So well said. Gandhi said, I, I love your Jesus. I just don't like your Christians. Uh, the, worst part about Christ- the worst part about Christianity is Christians. But the best part is Christ. And it's the only good part. It's yeah, Christ. It's the only good part. Right? Like we're... And, 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 and at the time, well, I mean, the only... Yes, I would also say there are there is there is goodness in when He dwells in us. Mm. But it's not us doing it. Right. It's, like it's, it's nothing no longer that we I who live, it's Christ who lives within me. So it's like the only good thing apart, the only good thing about me is Christ. Exactly. Everything else is sin. It's sin. Yeah. And it's imperfect. So, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's what throws people off. Like, I think most people that have had a bad experience with Christianity haven't actually had a bad experience with Jesus. It's oh, yeah. Because you actually realize... No, you can't, have a, you, can't, you can't have a bad experience with Jesus, at least in the sense of, like, he won't do you wrong. He'll, he might give you uh, justice for something you've done. Like, you know, uh, when, he, when he cast out the demons into the, the 200 swine, the yep. farmer might have felt bad, but there's a deeper reason behind why why he did that. So yep. he can't actually do you wrong. You can just do him wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Dude, 100%. And, and I also think that what a lot of people don't experience is the more you live the way you're supposed to in the Christian faith, like actually the happier you are, yeah. you know? So it's like, I think a lot of people think, oh, there's all these rules and there's all this caution tape and I can't do this and I can't do that. But when you actually try and strive to live that way, you realize that it's like it's just the operating manual for like how to live the best life. God does not lead us away from sin because he wants to control us. He does it because he wants to protect us because he knows sin is not what we're created for. Yep. Sin is just missing the mark. That's it. Yep. So he knows it's like and I uh, this is why I have so much appreciation for actually building a relationship with Jesus because I lived the majority of my life without it. And so I just went into how can I sleep with as many women as possible? How can I make as much money as possible? And so I was able to actually see those things for what they are, which I think a lot of Christians maybe don't experience, which, hey, you're not missing out on much. Yeah. Uh, so don't, don't feel like you need to go try. Yeah. But I can just say from my perspective, I know how unfulfilling those things are. I know how deceitful those things are. And that's what makes, that. I mean, for me personally, at least, that's what gives me such a great appreciation for actually knowing Jesus because I know he actually is the truth of the matter. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for me now, it's not even like, 
pulling teeth like it's like this is the way that I've now learned that I want to live. Yeah. It's not even like a battle or a struggle. It's like, okay, well, this is the way that Jesus has called us to live. This is the way we're supposed to live. This is the way that we live with the most fulfillment and the most happiness, you know? So it's also like, it's not like a painful thing. Like, I think a lot of people see it as like, oh, it's really tough and it's really, you know, hard. And it is hard at times. There's temptation. There's things that, you know, you're going to be thrown off by. You're not always going to be perfect. But it's like, it is the way to live a fulfilled, satisfied, happy life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think the more people reframe that thought process, I think the happier they'll be. Yeah, I was reading in a book yesterday, like almost all the problems in the world, almost all the problems in the world, if not all the problems in the world, how many, how many of them would be solved if people just were more like Jesus, if people actually became Christ-like? The problem is the Christians a lot of times are the least Christ-like and the most Pharisaic. Yep. And it's the exact opposite of what Jesus wanted, but that's a whole another podcast yeah. we could go into. Yeah, for sure. Um, but man, we covered a plethora of that topics, was fun, man. and this was such a cool conversation. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we could kind of just riff on some stuff. Also, hear some of your background and business experiences, and the way you view some things, and the way you view this world. And I thought you brought a lot of insight and wisdom into this conversation. So, likewise, bro, yeah. blessing to have you. Glad to have you here in North Carolina. Yeah, me too, dude. It's We're nice here. Smack I like some it. food. Let's do and, it. Uh, yeah, any, any last words for the people? Where can they find you? Yep. And any final words of wisdom? Yeah, yeah. So Instagram's at John Danes, just J-O-H-N-D-A-N-E-S. Um, you know, we do some work with agencies as well. It's agencyclients.com. I'm, my thing is names. I love names. Agencyclients.com? I like that. I used to have SMMA fulfillment. That's good. That was my white label. That's a good one. Yeah. Serveothers.com is the, the one I'm That's a great one, right too. Now. Agencyclients.com. That's a that's, that's a killer a one. one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm proud of Let's that. Let's go, agency guys. Check out the website. Just yeah. check it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Just, just peek around. Just peek got. around. Might be able to grab a few free resources or something. We have some good free resources that we put together. So, yeah. And I think the main thing is just like, it's all a journey. You know, like don't beat yourself up if you have yeah. a bad day. Like just understand. Like when you fall in love with the process, you're gonna get the outcome that you want quicker, and you're gonna be satisfied while doing it. Because if you're only chasing the end goal. Mm. then you're not going to be fulfilled throughout the, the process. And I guess that's my parting words of wisdom, which we've touched on a lot. But to summarize it, that's what I would say. Let's go, bro. Thank you, brother. My pleasure. Appreciate thank you, man. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, it was awesome. likewise. Yeah, Let's thank go. you. Thank Guys, you for having me. I'll see you in the next one. Much love as always. Peace out. Serve others.